analog circuits are made up of very few elements. We've got uh, resistors like bulbs, we've got batteries, we've got switches, and uh, we also have uh, capacitors that we can put in circuits. And later in the semester we'll find that we can add an inductor. We'll talk about that right at the end of the semester. Um, today we'd like to talk about what happens when we put a capacitor in our circuit. You remember from our lecture on capacitors that they store charge and also energy, uh, electrostatic potential energy. And, uh, and as we found back then, the definition of capacitance or the ability to store charge was just how much charge it could store for each one volt rise in uh, the voltage across the capacitor. Now you remember whenever you have a definition, you use three lines here. And if you have a definition that's a ratio, um, put one in the denominator and that'll give your gut some understanding of what's going on. If the change in voltage is one, then the capacitance, how much it can hold, is the charge on the capacitor. And remember, when we have a capacitor, there's two plates. Uh, one gets charged up positively, and one gets charged up negatively. So if the charge on that capacitor is four coulombs, uh, what we really mean is that there's a positive four coulombs on the positive plate, a negative four coulombs on the negative plate. So the, the capacitor is really neutral. But it's only the negative charges, the electrons, that are free to flow around and do something useful like light a bulb or run a, a, a motor. Now, uh, your homework for this lecture, we have one problem that is in the book in chapter 18, problem 39, and I'll talk about that problem later in the lecture. And then two special problems uh, that are at the D2L site. Um, you can download that from there. Now, <clears throat> I'll remind you that we had a pretest a while ago, and I asked you, uh, what's the voltage difference between A and B with that switch open? And it surprised some of you that the answer was not zero. The answer turns out to be 12 volts. And uh, the way we see that is that, uh, let me get my pointer. <clears throat> that bulb is dark. There's no complete path. And a dark bulb has zero volts across it. That bulb's also dark. It has zero volts across it. Well, I gotta have a 12 volt drop across that whole circuit because I've got a 12 volt battery in there. And so that means the full 12 volt drop has to be across that gap right there. And if I look from A to B, that's the voltage drop across the gap, plus the voltage drop across this bulb. Well, that's 12 volts plus zero volts, so the answer would be 12 volts. The key idea is that when we said what goes up must come down, that the voltage rise and drops must be equal around any loop, we meant any. It doesn't have to be a closed loop. Any loop from one side of the battery to the other has to have voltage drops equal to the rise in voltage across the battery. Now, <clears throat> let's set the stage here again. I have four identical bulbs, all made at the same factory on the same day by the same worker, and they're connected in that way to a 12-volt battery. Now, you know from what we learned about circuits that number one is the brightest bulb, and then number two is the second brightest bulb, and then three and four are tied for last. Um, but what if we took out bulb two and left the empty socket behind? Instead of a bulb here, there would just be a gaping hole. And the question is, if I were to take a voltmeter and measure the voltage across that gaping hole or that empty socket, 
what would I read? And your answers, your possible answers, are 12 volts, 9 volts, 8 volts, 6 volts, or 0 volts. Now, I know you don't, we're not using clickers. Uh, I'm the only person in the room right now. I've got a clicker. But before I vote, I'd like you to think about what your answer would be. What would you vote if you were in the room right now? Well, let's start. I will vote, and I will vote for the class, and I voted C, okay? I voted 8 volts. Now, why is it 8 volts? <clears throat> if you want to learn something about the sun, if you would like to observe the sun, the most important rule is don't look directly at the sun. Look away from the sun. Find some way to learn about the sun without looking at it. You'll blind yourself, okay? The same thing is true when you're trying to find the voltage across an empty, uh, empty socket or a gap, a hole. Um, if it's in a parallel circuit, don't look directly at the sun. Look away from the sun. Look at the other branch that's parallel to it. Because you know you have to have the same voltage across parallel branches. Now, if this is an empty socket, no current can flow down this way. It's broken. That means all the current that goes through one has to go through three and then through four. That means one, three, and four will be in series and equally bright. And if they're equally bright, they've got the same voltage across them, and it's got to add up to 12. So that means this is going to be 4 volts, 4 volts, and 4 volts. Well, that means that the voltage from here to here would be 4 volts plus 4 volts, or 8 volts, from there to there. That means there's 8 volts from here to here. And that would be the voltage across that empty socket. So the answer... Uh, whoops. The answer is 8 volts. Good. Talk to your neighbor about that. Oh, yes, you can, because you're in uh, California right now. Okay. <clears throat> now, suppose I went down to the store, and I bought two 12-volt car batteries, and I hooked them up to a single bulb like this. Now remember the long line on a battery symbol is the positive terminal. So you see that these two batteries are fighting each other. This battery is trying to force conventional current clockwise and this battery is trying to force conventional current counterclockwise. How bright is that bulb going to be? Well, it's going to be dark. Those two are equally strong, those batteries, and they're, they're canceling each other out. So nothing flows through that bulb, and it's dark. Now, I have a philosophical question for you. Is this in some way the same thing? I mean, if I just replace this battery, this 12-volt battery, with an open switch, the bulb is dark, just like that bulb, and I've got 12 volts, a 12-volt drop from here to here, just like I have from here to here. So in many ways, it's exactly the same. The only thing that's missing is the chemistry of this battery right here. We're using a gap instead of the chemistry to cause that 12-volt drop. Now suppose I go back to that store and this time I don't have as much money. And so instead of buying two 12-volt batteries, I say, hey, just give me one 12-volt battery, and while you're at it, throw in a zero-volt battery. A zero-volt battery. Now, this battery is trying to force conventional current clockwise, and this 
battery is trying to make it go counterclockwise, but they're not pushing the same. Indeed, this one's not pushing. And so when I ask how bright is that bulb, well, it's very bright. It's 12 volts bright, okay? Now, another philosophical question. Is this the same? I replaced that zero volt battery with just a wire. Well, we know from what we learned about circuits that for an ideal wire, there's zero volts across it, just like this zero volt battery. And so in both cases, I would have a bulb that's 12 volts bright, and in both cases, I would measure zero volts from here to here. Okay? So in many ways, those are identical. Now, what does that have to do with a capacitor? Well, if I go back to this definition of capacitance, I see that I can rewrite this definition as the voltage across the capacitor is equal to Q stored in the capacitor divided by the capacitance C in farads. Okay? Now, what you see here is that a capacitor can act like a, a variable strength battery. When it's empty, when Q is zero, it acts like a zero volt battery or a wire. And then the more charge I put in that capacitor, the bigger the voltage uh, across the capacitor. It becomes a stronger and stronger battery, if you will, without the chemistry. Okay? Well, let's look at a simple, we call it an RC circuit, R for resistance and C for capacitance. And in this case, we have a single bulb and a single capacitor. Now, uh, in the olden days when I was alive, capacitors, um, well, we, we weren't able to store very much charge. And typically a capacitor was measured in picofarads or microfarads, uh, 10 to the minus 9 farads. Um, something like a half a farad uh, hasn't been possible until, um, until your lifetime when we've had some, uh, some interesting technology take place. So here I have a, one of those high capacitance capacitors. Here's my single bulb. And you see that it's not right now um, a circuit. There's a gap right here. I haven't connected this positive terminal to the pos uh, this lead to the positive terminal of the battery. And so this gap right here is playing the part of this open switch right there. Okay? Now, we start with the capacitor empty. If the capacitor is empty, that means the voltage across the capacitor is zero, and that capacitor is going to initially uh, act like a wire. Well, let's look at what happens as we close the switch here. Now, initially, I have zero volts across that capacitor. Uh, we just talked about that. Uh, what about that bulb? Well, that bulb is dark, and a dark bulb has zero volts across it. Well, any path from one side of the battery to the other has to have a 12-volt uh, drop if there's a 12-volt battery in there. And that means the 12 volts has to drop across that open switch. And indeed, if we were to take a voltmeter and measure it from this point to this point, we would find a 12-volt difference there. Now, what if we close that switch? Well, we know that a closed switch has zero volts across it. That's just like a wire. And we know that that battery, I'm sorry, let me speak of, uh, do that again. 
uh, we know that right after we close that switch, right after we close that switch, the capacitor is still empty. It takes time to fill up a capacitor with charge, okay? So right after I close the switch, that's still a zero volt battery. That's still acting like a wire. And that means that all of the 12 volt drop has to be across that bulb. And suddenly that bulb is acting as if it's in a single bulb circuit because essentially it is. The capacitor is acting like a wire. And so that means I have a bright bulb, 12 volts bright, and more flow, more glow, that means there's a lot of flow, conventional current, going through that bulb. Now, in going through the bulb, it charges up the capacitor. We end up with positive charge on this plate, negative charge on that plate, okay? Now, we know, we know that what's really happening is electrons are going the other way. Electrons leave this plate, leaving naked protons behind, and come around and land on this plate. But we always talk about conventional current, the flow of positive charge, undoing the mistake that uh, Brother Ben Franklin made. Okay? Now, if I wait long enough for that capacitor to get charged up, to get enough charge on it, to have four volts across the plates, then that means there's only 8 volts across the bulb. That means it's not as bright as it used to be. And that means there's not as much flow going through it, which means not as much flow going to the capacitor. Now, there's still flow going to the capacitor, and the capacitor is still getting uh, charged up, which means the voltage across the capacitor is still increasing. If we wait long enough for that capacitor to have 8 volts across it, now there's only 4 volts across the bulb. And it's dim. And uh, that means there's not much flow going through it. Eventually, we get that capacitor so charged up that it now has all of the voltage across that loop. And that means that there's nothing left for the bulb. The bulb goes out. Okay? Now, let's, uh, let's demonstrate that. I'm going to close this switch and watch what happens to the bulb. It starts out 12 volts bright, then it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and eventually goes out. Now, you've seen that before. This is not something that you had to come to a physics class to see. Uh, you saw that when you last got in your car, if it's a newer model, and closed the door. The headlamp just went on so that you could see where your keys were, and then it dimmed out. Any analog circuit that has a dimmer like that, a timing switch, uh, involves a capacitor, okay? That's how we, how we make it happen. Now, <clears throat> once it's gone out and the capacitor is charged up, we open the switch. And if we open the switch like that, now, where's, uh, what's the voltage across that switch? Well, I've got a 12-volt rise here. I've got a 0-volt drop there. I've got a 12-volt drop there. I've got just as much rise as I have drop. So I don't need anything across that gap. And indeed, that's what I would measure if I measured across that gap. But what if I were to remove the battery? What if I were to take the battery out of the circuit? Well now, 
I got 12 volts from here to here, a 12 volt drop. Or, thinking of it another way, I've got a 12 volt rise from there to there. Okay? Now, this is now acting like a battery, and around any loop from one side of the battery to the other, I've got to have a voltage drop equal to the battery. And that means that right now, I've got 12 volts across that gap. And indeed, that's what I would measure from here to here. But if I close that switch, a closed switch always has zero volts across it. It acts like a wire. And so now, the 12 volt drop is going to be across that bulb. Okay? And that means the bulb is going to be bright. And that means there's current flowing through it. Now remember, we're talking about conventional current, or the flow of positive charge. All of this positive charge was built up on, the, on this plate of the capacitor, and, and that's going to try to drive current counterclockwise. Now, in driving that current, through the bulb, we're also discharging the capacitor. Charge is leaving the plates. Okay, and that means that eventually I'm going to get that capacitor voltage down to 8 volts. It's acting now like an 8 volt battery. Well, that's driving less current through the bulb. The bulb is going to be dimmer. But I'm still driving current around the circuit. I'm still discharging the capacitor. Eventually I get down to 4 volts and then down to zero volts. And in the process, the, the bulb uh, dims and the capacitor discharges. Well, let's see that. Let's watch that happen. Again, I'll dim the lights. I'm going to close the switch just by connecting these two leads. There's your 12 volt bulb, and now it's eight volts, and now it's four volts. And now it's zero volts. Physics works. That's what makes it different from biology. OK. Now, let's practice that idea with this problem 39 from your textbook. Um, this problem. Uh, Let's see, I think what I'll do is I'll just move this around like that. Okay, we're back live here. Um, this is that homework problem. And uh, you'll find when you're solving problems involving capacitors in circuits that there are three times that we can talk about without using calculus, okay, without using fancy mathematics. There are three times that we can um, say something about the circuit. Um, and so a lot of times, these problems have an A, B, and a C. This particular problem just has an A and a B. We're only going to look at two of those times. But the next problem, the next sample problem we look at, uh, will have all three. Now, um, what is happening here? Just stay where I want you. Freeze. OK. There we go. Now, those times that we are able to talk about, the first time, part A, is right after the switch is closed. Because it takes time to charge up a capacitor, that means the change in voltage across the capacitor, which is just the charge divided by C, is going to Be zero. And that means that the capacitor
acts like a wire. Okay? So uh, let's look at, at this circuit here. If the capacitor is acting like a wire, I can redraw that circuit. Okay, uh, there's the wire right here. And this is bulb A, B, C, and D. Okay? Now, you know that A is an indicator bulb for that battery, so all of the current is going to flow through that bulb A. And then it comes to this junction and splits, but not 50-50 because it sees an easy path and a hard path. So more than half is going to go the easy way. Less than half is going to go the hard way. So let's go and do your homework for you here. What is the voltage difference across the capacitor? Well, the voltage difference across the capacitor... You're still uh, unfrozen. I'm sorry? You're frozen on the screen. Ah, okay. So... so zoom in. Oh, for crying out loud. What is wrong with this thing? So, the voltage difference across the capacitor is Q over C, but that's going to be zero. So it acts like a wire. And that means that bulb B is going to be brighter than bulb C because current favors the path of least resistance. Okay? These are pretty easy. If you understand circuits, you understand circuits with capacitors if you just put in a few little extra ideas. Now, the second time that we can talk about is a long time after the switch is closed. So that means the capacitor is full. There's no more room in that capacitor in this particular circuit. It's reached the, the largest voltage it can in this circuit. Now, that means the capacitor acts like an open switch. So let me redraw that circuit with an open switch. Okay? And remember this is bulb A and B and C and D. Now if that's an open switch, that means that all the current that goes through A has to go through C and then through D and back around. That means that A, C, and D are now in series with each other. And that means that they're all equally bright. And uh, that means they each have to, if this is a 12-volt battery, they have to have 4 volts, 4 volts, and 4 volts. Now B is dark. It's on an incomplete path with no current flowing along it, so that's going to be 0 volts, which means I have to have 8 volts across the capacitor. So if I go back to the homework, um, 
bulb B is now dimmer than bulb C. B is out. Quick little aside. B is out. Is B shorted out? Mm, no or heck no. It's heck no. B is on an incomplete path. Just because a bulb is out does not mean it's shorted out. In order to short out a bulb, you've got to put a wire from one side of the bulb to the other. Now, is that just semantics? No. If, if there's a short in your house, your house burns down if you don't have those, uh, those fuses in your fuse box. But if your bulb is on an incomplete path, it just doesn't light. Now, what is the voltage difference across bulb A? Well, the voltage difference across bulb A, we said, was 4 volts. And that's the voltage of A is equal to the voltage of C is equal to the voltage across D. And when I say voltage, what I really mean is the change in voltage from one side to the other. And those are all equal to 4 volts. Bulb B is out, it's dark, and the capacitor, the voltage across the capacitor is equal to the voltage across C plus the voltage across D, which is 8 volts. Okay. Now the last part of this problem asks us to find this the charge stored on the capacitor. Well, we can rewrite that definition of capacitance to look like this. Okay? The capacitance is just how much charge you can store for a one volt rise in voltage, and then you multiply that by how many volts you actually uh, increase the voltage. So in this case, the capacitance is given as 0.5 coulombs. I, no, farads. Vol, uh, capacitance is in farads. But, and then the voltage is going to be 8 volts. But this is what I was trying to say, and I didn't do it very well. A farad is just a fancy way of honoring microfaraday, but what we really mean is coulombs per volt. And if I multiply that by 8 volts, the volts cancel out, and I'm left with 4 coulombs. Okay. Talk to your neighbor. See if your neighbor got that homework problem right. I'm guessing the people that watch this video get it right and the people that just try to do the homework without the video, not so much. Now, at the D2L site, I've posted a, uh, a handout, and uh, just for your convenience, it uh, has this problem we just solved, and then it also has this problem here that uh, I just included, um, this problem is very similar to one of the other ho homework problems. And by similar, I mean almost the same, except for the resistances have been changed and the voltage across the battery has been changed. But other than that, it looks like the same circuit. So let's finish up by looking at this uh, circuit here. Now, because we're always talking about the same times, I'm, I'm going to be able to use this, a lot of what's on the board here. Part A is immediately after the switch is closed. Well, immediately after the switch is closed, uh, the capacitor is still empty. We haven't had time to charge it up. 
And so that means the voltage across the capacitor is zero, which means the capacitor is acting like a wire. So let me redraw this circuit. Uh, I've got a battery that's 180 volts. That's pretty hefty. And then I come down here, and instead of the capacitor, I have a wire. And then I have a 15 ohm resistor, and that's R1. And then I have an 8 ohm resistor, and that's R2. And then I have a 2 ohm resistor, and that's R3. And then I have a R4 that is 30 ohms. And what we're asked for is the current magnitude and direction uh, through the battery. Well, I know the direction right away. The direction is up. It, conventional current leaves the positive terminal of the battery and comes back to the negative terminal of the battery. But what about the magnitude? Well, in order to find the magnitude, I need to find the equivalent resistance. The one resistor that would uh, replace that mess, okay? Well, I've got an 8 and a 2, that looks like a 10, so that top side looks like 15 ohms in parallel with 10 ohms. Well, remember what we do when we have parallel paths that aren't the same resistance. We look for a common denominator. The common denominator between 15 and 10 is 30. So I can write the 15 as two 30s. I'm leaving off the units there just to make things less messy. I can make a 10 ohm resistor with three 30s. So this is exactly the same as that, which is exactly the same as the top half of this circuit. And now I can say I've got five paths that are all equal. They each have 30 ohms on it, and so the resistance is going to be the resistance of one path divided by the number of paths, or six ohms. Okay? Now, that means that this whole circuit looks like that. Okay? So this is going to be 36 ohms, 180 volts. If I use V equals IR, Globally, this becomes the equivalent resistance of the circuit. This becomes the battery voltage. This becomes the current through the battery. And if I solve that for the current through the battery, I get 5 amps. Now, we want to know the voltage difference across R3 from this point A to this point B. Well, I can use Ohm's law locally, where I'm just finding the voltage from A to B. It's the current that flows from A to B and the resistance between A and B, which is R3. Now, in order to do that, I need to figure out how the current splits right there. 
and then it comes back together right here. I've got five amps going in, but that five amp splits. Now, here's where this method that I taught you comes in really handy. If I have five amps coming into that junction right there, what it sees are five identical paths. There's no reason to choose one path over the other. So what I'm going to get is one amp going there, and 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 one amp going there. Now remember, these 230s here are this 15 ohm resistor, so that means I got two amps going that way. These three paths, these 330s, represent that 10 ohm resistor, so I'm going to have three amps going that way. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that the difficulty of these two paths are three to two. Uh, they're in a three to two ratio, okay? And that means that the current's got to split in a three to two ratio with the larger chunk going to the easier path. So I'm going to have three amps going down this path and only two amps going down that path. Now remember what we're looking for. We're looking for the voltage difference across R3. Well, that voltage difference across R3 is going to be the current that flows through between R A and B through R3. That's three amps times the resistance of R3, which is 2 ohms, and that's going to give me 6 volts. Okay? Now, let's go to part B. A long time after the switch is closed, uh, that capacitor is full. It acts like an open switch. And so now I have 180 volts driving current over here I've got an open switch and then I've got this R1 R2 R3 and R4 and then back now in this case um, the current is all gonna flow through R2, R3, and R4. And that means, since this is 8 ohms, and this is 2 ohms, and this is 30 ohms, that what this looks like is 8 plus 2 plus 30, or 40 ohms, with 180 whoops, wrong symbol, volts. Now if I use V equals IR globally, uh, this is going to be 180 volts is going to drive current through 40 ohms that's going to give me a current through the battery of 4.5 amps. And it's going to again be going up out of the positive terminal. Now, <coughs> what about the charge stored on the capacitor? Well, the charge on a capacitor is just equal to the capacitance times the voltage across the capacitor. So what we need to do is find this voltage across the capacitor. Well, this open switch was the capacitor. It acts like an open switch or a gaping hole. So if I want to know the voltage from here to here, I look away from the sun. 
I don't look over here, I look at the parallel branch. Well, if I have 4.5 amps flowing across from here to here, that would be 10 ohms. Let's call this both A prime and B prime. The voltage from A prime to B prime is going to be 4.5 amps times 10 ohms or 45 volts. Now, what's the voltage across R1? Well, there's nothing flowing through it, so this is going to be 0 volts, and so that means I'm going to have 45 volts here. Well, that answers my question. The charge is just the capacitance, which we're given in the problem, as 1.5 farads. Remember, farad is just a fancy way of saying coulombs per volt. And then I multiply that by 45 volts, and I get 67.5 coulombs. Okay? Now, you'll get something different in your homework problem because you've got different resistances and different, uh, different battery. Now we get to a part that makes this problem a little bit different than the first problem. Remember, I told you there were three times that we could talk about. There was an A, a B, and a C. The last time that we can talk about is after the switch has been closed a long time. Right after you open the switch. Just like it takes time to charge up a capacitor, it takes time to empty a capacitor. And so if I leave that switch closed long enough for it to get charged up, in this case charged up was 45 volts. That's full, okay? Um, if I leave the switch closed for five weeks, it's going to stay, the voltage across that capacitor is going to stay 45 volts. Now, as soon as I open the switch, that capacitor is going to start to discharge. And, uh, and it's eventually going to drain away to zero, empty. But that takes time. So if I look right after, right after you open that switch, the capacitor acts like a battery. So if I were to draw that circuit now, opening the switch takes the, uh, the battery right out of there. The battery is no longer part of the circuit. And so all I've got now is a capacitor that's got 45 volts across it, hooked up to a 8-ohm resistor and a 2-ohm resistor and a 15-ohm resistor. And because I charge this up with the positive charge on the side of the capacitor closest to the positive terminal of the battery, it's going to be charged up like that. And now that 45-volt battery, that really is a capacitor, is going to drive current around that loop. And now the R1, R2, and R3 are in series. And so that means if I use B equals IR, I'm going to have 45 volts pushing current through 8 plus 2 is 10 plus 25, 
I'm sorry, but 15 is 25 ohms. And that's going to give me a current of 1.8 amps. Now, we're asked to find the magnitude and direction of the conventional current through resistor R1. Well, the magnitude's going to be the same through R1 as it is through R2, as it is through, whoops, this is R1, this is R2, this is R3. Again, old guy. So it's going to be 1.8 amps, whether I'm talking about through R1 or R2 or R3. It's just going to be going up through R1, down through R2, and down through R3, because it's running clockwise around that loop. Now, what if I want the voltage difference across R4? Well, let's look at R4 here. When I open this switch, R4 is just out flapping in the breeze. It's not part of the circuit anymore, just like the battery. And so there's nothing flowing through R4, and so the voltage across it would be It has no current. And the current through R1 is going to be 1.8 amps up. OK. Um, what do I need to remember from this lecture? Well. Circuits with uh, capacitors in them uh, act very much like regular circuits without capacitors, except that you've got to deal with that capacitor filling up and becoming a, a stronger and stronger battery. Now, the only times that we can talk about those types of circuits uh, without using fancy mathematics are A, right after the switch is closed, the capacitor is acting like a wire because it's got zero volts across it like a wire. B, a long time after the switch is closed, when the capacitor's had enough time to fill up. And full means different things in different circuits. In this simple circuit here, full meant the 12 volts of the battery. In our second problem, full meant the 8 volts that was the voltage across bulbs C and D. In this problem here, full meant 45, 45 volts. It, it changes from circuit to circuit. But once it's full, the capacitor is going to act like an open switch. So just redraw your circuit and replace the capacitor with an open switch and solve the problem just like you used to. And then the last time we can talk about C is after the switch has been closed a long time, Look right after you open it, because right after you open it, the capacitor is still full. It hasn't had time to drain yet. And you already figured out how full full is. You know, it's 12 volts or 8 volts or 45 volts, depending on the circuit. But whatever full meant, that's the voltage across that capacitor. And now it's going to act like a battery driving current as it discharges. Okay? And that's all you've got to remember. So uh, keep your head about you. We'll see you in a little bit.